Good morning, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Angry Astronauts. Kind of a quick bulletin more than anything else, but a pretty big bulletin in the field of space flight. I am in Greenville, back home officially, and if you're wondering what the hell am I still doing in a hotel room, well, <laughs> the lovely storm that came through here and the unusually low temperatures resulted in my house experiencing a burst pipe. And that happened days ago, actually, when I was still in Colorado, and apparently my landlords, uh, the, uh, the company that I rent from, can't really be bothered to get it fixed, and so I'm still stuck in a uh, hotel room until all of that gets taken care of. And it may indeed be possible that I don't actually go home at all because I'm going to be going back to Britain, but... Anyway, that's, uh, there, there are people in much worse uh, shape than I am as a result of this storm and everything going on right now. So I'm going to stop complaining and get on with the story. SpaceX. Uh, what can what can I say about this company and their incredible accomplishments uh, over the last dozen years or so? It's amazing what this company has been able to do. Back in 2010, SpaceX was barely valued at a billion dollars, but now SpaceX has just catapulted into a whole new world of valuation. We're talking 137 billion dollars right now. That is of course, more than five times the entire annual budget of NASA. This is an unbelievably colossal organization, and they certainly deserve the valuation that they currently have because of their accomplishments. I mean, really, when it comes right down to it, in the world of space flight, at least in the Western world, there is nobody except SpaceX. There is SpaceX and everybody else who's really kind of small potatoes by comparison. SpaceX definitely seems to be on the top of the heap. And will this ever change? Because all of Elon's current escapades with Twitter and, and Tesla being devalued significantly, all of this seems to have no effect whatsoever on SpaceX, nor should it, given the level of success that they've been enjoying. But is SpaceX invincible? Is this a company that has nothing but a bright future ahead of it, regardless of what happens? Well, no. This is a very important year for SpaceX, 2023, where a number of things absolutely have to happen. Otherwise, this company, as impossible as this may sound, may find itself in a tight spot. As most spaceflight enthusiasts know, SpaceX sent up 61 rockets in 2022. No company, no nation has come close to approximating that kind of capability. China managed to launch approximately 50 rockets during the same year, but very few of those rockets had the same payload capability of Falcon 9. When it comes right down to it, SpaceX utterly dominated dominates not only the private spaceflight industry, but the national spaceflight industry. They absolutely crush the competition when it comes to sheer volume. But here's one of the problems. What you're watching right now is a Starlink launch, and the vast majority of the launches that took place in 2022 were Starlink launches. And as of right now, Starlink is still not turning a profit for SpaceX, and there are some very good reasons for that. Without the extremely important version 2 satellite, which according to Elon can only really be deployed by Starship, the Starlink network is simply unable to handle the number of customers that it's going to take for this company to turn a profit. And that is a big problem. And by the way, this is something that's been backed up by all of the data according to a survey recently conducted by a company called Ookla of every region 
region that Starlink services. Quote, Speed test intelligent reveals that median download speeds for Starlink fell across Canada, France, Germany, New Zealand, the UK, and the US, dropping between 9% and 54% from the second quarter of 2021 to the second quarter of 2022 as more users signed up for the service. Now, Starlink, of course, does provide extremely fast access to remote areas that desperately need it. However, for the company to really turn a decent profit, it needs to provide superior download speeds or at least the same download speeds as fixed broadband providers do in major countries where they have lots of customers. This, of course, would include the United States and Canada. However, as of right now, fixed broadband providers in the U.S. are providing more than double the download speeds of Starlink, and in Canada, it's about 50% faster. And as far as upload speeds are concerned, it gets even worse. The only country in North America where Starlink outperforms fixed broadband as far as upload speeds are concerned is in Mexico. And I got to experience this firsthand when I was staying in Alamosa in the remote San Luis Valley of Colorado. Grand Starlink provided an extremely important service in this region because it doesn't have a huge number of choices when it comes to broadband providers, but when I tried to upload a relatively small video to YouTube, it was one of the longest uploads that I have ever experienced. What would have taken me three or four minutes in most of the locations where I stayed, including, including hotels, took over 30 minutes in Alamosa using Starlink. Starlink. And what about latency? I mean, Starlink was supposed to have a huge advantage there. Well, at least in the U.S., that hasn't really materialized. Starlink provides a latency of about 48 milliseconds on average, as opposed to 14 milliseconds for all fixed broadband providers combined. That's a pretty huge difference. Now, obviously, the latency is much better in regions where you can't get very good fixed broadband, but sadly, those areas are kind of few and far between. In order to produce enormous profits, the kinds of profits that Elon talked about when he first rolled out Starlink, Starlink is going to have to provide at least equivalent and hopefully better latency capabilities in fixed broadband areas in order to be competitive. And as of right now, that has yet to materialize, and it probably won't materialize until the version 2 satellite is out, which is why Starship absolutely has to take flight as rapidly as possible. So no matter how much value SpaceX may have on paper, unless Starship takes flight very soon, hopefully in 2023, and I'm not talking about an orbital test, I'm talking about a functional rocket that's capable of deploying version 2 satellites, SpaceX may have a hard time producing the amount of revenue to justify their huge valuation. Now, it's going to be a long time before that really becomes a problem, and SpaceX SpaceX seems to be very capable of raising the necessary money that they need for their operations, at least at present, but that's not going to last forever. Starship needs to fly, and it needs to fly soon. And that's not the only problem. In addition to that, up to this point, for quite some time, SpaceX really hasn't had any competition when it comes to NASA contracts or U.S. Space Force contracts. In spite of the fact that Falcon 9 did not deliver a single cargo to geosynchronous orbit in 2022. The only direct to geosynchronous orbit cargo that was delivered by SpaceX was delivered by Falcon Heavy, and there are very good reasons for that. Falcon 9's payload capabilities, at least if you want to reuse the booster, are quite frankly inferior to the ULA Atlas V, which by the way is going out of service, which is one of the the big reasons that SpaceX hasn't had any competition for upcoming contracts, but it's interesting to note that Atlas V actually delivered five cargoes direct to geosynchronous orbit in 2022, whereas SpaceX delivered only one and with Falcon Heavy. 
If Blue Origin hadn't spent all of 2022 screwing around with the BE-4 engine and if Vulcan Centaur had actually been in the picture, SpaceX would have had much stiffer competition for a lot of the missions that they secured in 2022. For example, the Europa Clipper mission that's being launched by a Falcon Heavy netted SpaceX $178 million, not $90 million, which is the base cost for a Falcon Heavy heavy mission, but $178 million because, frankly, SpaceX didn't have any competition and could charge pretty much whatever they wanted to, given that the only other alternative was SLS, which, of course, would have been ridiculously expensive. Assuming that Vulcan Centaur actually comes online in mid-February when it's supposed to, SpaceX may experience much stronger competition for future government contracts. However, that that may also not be the case because ULA has now secured all kinds of launches with Amazon and the Kuiper constellation, which is going to consume a great number of their future Vulcan Centaur launches. It may be very difficult for ULA to bid on any future launches, given the fact that they're going to be pushing 25 launches a year in order to accommodate all of their current contracts. So, SpaceX may still have the luxury of being able to bid on a lot of government contracts without substantial competition, but time will tell. But don't get me wrong, SpaceX definitely holds the crown for the number one launch provider in the world, and that is unlikely to change in 2023, regardless of what happens with Starlink. Driven by reusability and the incredible performance of the Falcon 9, SpaceX is going to hold on to its dominance for a long time to come, regardless of what companies may start nipping at their heels in 2023 and beyond. SpaceX has changed the face of human space flight forever, and nobody can take that away from them. Smash that like, hit that subscribe, please check the description for various ways to support my content as I travel across the Atlantic once again, and also as I prepare to cover other launches from Cape Canaveral, Boca Chica, and elsewhere, and as always, stay angry about space!